everybody. You are listening to the Fiscal Feminist Podcast, where we will be tackling real financial issues so women can eliminate fear and take charge of their lives. I am your host, Kimberly Davis, and I am the Fiscal Feminist. So let's get to it. It's the yes budget. And really what a yes budget is, is I need to take care of my expenses, right? I need to pay my bills and I need to cover my necessities. My necessities are how am I going to feed myself, how am I going to clothe myself, get myself to work, those kinds of things, right? Right. And then the next step is what are our future goals? What are we putting money towards? And then after that, it's yes to anything that I want to spend my money on. So, you know, a lot of times people say, I hate budgeting because it tells me I can't do this and I can't do that. Well, if you know exactly what it is you want, then all you say is, yes to spending money on those things. And a budget is an enabler to get you to the yes, you know, the big yes. Hello, everybody. Welcome today. I'm very happy to welcome you to the Fiscal Feminist Podcast because today is going to be an amazing day. I am interviewing two men, okay? So this is, I I do think it's the first time that I have done a podcast where I am interviewing not one man, but two men. (laughs) And I am very, very, Very lucky to have these guys. Um, They've got quite the following. They are referred to as the debt-free guys, and they also have their own um, podcast called Queer Money Podcast, and they are David and John Ottenschneider. So welcome, guys. Thank you so much for joining me today. I appreciate you taking time out of your busy schedule to share your knowledge and views with us today. Hello. Thank you for having us. Thank you. Where are you guys at right now? <laughs> we are <laughs> brace yourself. We live in the fabulous metropolis of Toledo, Ohio. <laughs> oh my God, I've been to Toledo, Ohio a long time ago. I had to do a deal there when I was a lawyer and I was driving through Toledo because I uh, flew in from New York, but I'm from Pittsburgh, so okay. I'm feeling Toledo. I love Toledo. I go back to Pittsburgh all the time. My parents are very elderly, so I go back there all the time. I was listening to your podcast about the best places to live. Mm-hmm if you were in the LGBTQ community. And I just thought it was really, they're just absolutely great podcast to listen to. So I highly recommend that you check out their podcast because it's really, really funny and interesting. And they impart a lot of very good knowledge that you might want to know. So oh, go how on. did you come to, <laughs> ta- how did that come into being? What, what How did that happen? Well, so this is John. Uh, several years ago, we wrote an article on our website, uh, debtfreeguys.com, the best places to live as an LGBTQ person, the best places to move. And it was one of the best articles we've ever written in terms of traffic. And so we've updated that over the years. And then um, we decided, uh, we wrapped up our bonus series where we covered the Motley Fool Debt for Guys LGBTQ plus money study. And we wanted to continue doing the bonus series. So we, we publish our normal episodes on Tuesdays. We publish our bonus shorter episodes on Thursdays. And we thought, well, what would people be interested in? And one of the most frequent questions that we get are, where can I live as an LGBTQ person, predominantly retire as an LGBTQ plus person, where I am completely accepted, there's no concern about my safety, people will accept me for who I am, but that I can also afford. Because most places that are accepting of LGBTQ plus people, San Francisco, LA, Chicago, New York City, right. they're all like one of the mo- some of the most expensive cities in the world. So that can really uh, hamstring people uh, trying to stretch their dollars further, especially in their retirement years. So we thought, well, what would it be like to analyze, uh, try to find the most affordable LGBTQ plus friendly city in each state? So we started to do that uh, a couple weeks ago. And in next week, we'll record the episode on Ohio. So we're curious to see if Toledo's going <laughs> to, where it's going to rank. <laughs> we're going to get to the debt payment thing, but this is really intriguing to me. So I want to talk about sure, this for a minute. Sure. Because actually, it is so relevant, right? Because it's about retirement. And I talk a lot about the fact that we are all living longer And we have these long retirements to fund. And we also need to enjoy our retirement and be in places that are accepting and that we enjoy and that we're not like stressed out about being at. So what are you looking for to rank these things? Like, how are you coming up with the rankings? Are you going and hanging out there for three weeks? Or are you just looking at some <laughs> If facts? you can find are a sponsor to make that happen, let yeah. us know. <laughs> we would love to, <laughs> I like love that to idea. visit all of these cities. No, so uh, we- I'm telling you, this is a TV show. That is a TV show. Well, it's something that we're discussing right now. We, yeah, we, we're working on making <laughs> it a little bit more visual. I would watch that TV show, but not to interrupt. <laughs> no, okay, so tell fine. me how you do it. You're fine. So when we decided to head to go down this path, um, we knew that we needed to have data where we could compare. 
We could compare apples to apples across all of these different states and cities, right? So when we're looking at one particular uh, state, we wanted to make sure that we were using the same data across all of the cities. So, So then that made us go out even further. What kind of national data would we be able to use? Our foundation for what cities we look at starts with the HRC does what's called the Municipal Equality Index. Cities can volunteer and ask to be basically be ranked or, or scored on how the city itself, their policies as a city, how they are doing to be inclusive. We started with that as the foundation because then we know that there's this, these are cities where someone has done the analysis at the city level. Right. One of the things that we used to find was that a lot of times these rankings of great places for LGBT people to live, they were oftentimes focused on things like the number of bars, how many coffee shops, right? those kinds of things. And, and, mm-hmm. and we were typically finding that those are the cities that are the expensive ones because New York has hundreds of gay bars, right? I mean, it's just... Right, so and millions of coffee shops. Exactly. Yeah. So we wanted to, to go in a different direction, and that's why we chose the affordability angle. So when we decided to go down the affordability angle... We chose to look at the average rent that is determined by what is called the Zori. It's Zillow's ranking of what an average two-bedroom apartment in that city would cost. And what they're looking at is the 40 to 60% range. They're not looking for, you know, those slum lords who charge two, yeah. 200 dollars or the places that are like seven thousand dollars they right they kind of they kind of take off the 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 high and low end so they're looking at kind of the what the average rent would be they also do a ranking uh, or a track of home prices or home values which is called the Zivi. Zivi. it's z h v i and both of these are available on uh, Zillow's website so we add both of those together, one, because we wanted the rents, and two, because we wanted home values. The next thing we use is bestplaces.net. It does a regular update of, of analyzing the cost of living in, in lots. And I mean, we're talking about, they did this for thousands and thousands of cities in the United States. Fascinating. I never knew any of this stuff. <laughs> I didn't know this information was out there. Yeah, yeah. we tried to use the, the um, U.S. Census data, but it wasn't as granular as uh, we were able to find with uh, Best Places. Yeah. Well, it, we do use the U.S. Census data for median and average income. So there's basically six pieces that go into the data. It's the the rent prices, the home prices, the cost of living, median income, average income, HRC's municipality equality index. And then the backdrop of it, is it open, accepting environment. Right. That's the Municipal Equality Index because it's going to tell us, does that city itself, the more likely a city that that you have a city that has policies that are open and accepting to the LGBT community, the more likely it is that you have a very strong LGBT community, not just a bunch of people who go out to bars, but you actually have the community that does things civically, right? Yes, they're proactive, they're involved. Exactly. Yeah. And that's really what we want. So are there any cities in Florida that have a good (laughs) municipal quality index? Do we know? I'm just curious. Not to be controversial, but I'd like to know the answer to that. um, We actually haven't gotten to Florida yet in our uh, our ranking, but you you will be surprised. We just did, I just did the data for Oklahoma. And most likely people would be like, there's no way anywhere in Oklahoma is going to do any, anything, any, have a, a g- great ranking. Well, it's a zero to 100 scale and Norman, Oklahoma gets a 100. Oh my God. Well, yeah. First of all, where is Norman, Oka- Oklahoma? I'm sorry. No, no worries. For anybody out there who's <laughs> listening from Norman, Oklahoma, but I, not really good with geography. No, no surprise, Norman, Oklahoma is actually where the uh, University of Oklahoma is based. Uh, okay. So it's a very okay. strong university population, and that's part of the reason why. But no, Norman, Oklahoma is actually a southern suburb of Oklahoma City. Uh, and so it's, that, it's still in a major metropolitan area. But you know, an, you know, another one that would probably surprise you, Brookings, South Dakota. It also got a 100 
And that's because the University of, well, it's actually South Dakota. I think it's South Dakota State University is there. So it's, that's a correlation we're seeing a lot in these more red states that yeah. you can t- typically find a, a city that gets 100 or close to 100 if it's near a college or university. Yeah. Well, and obviously, because you've got younger student, you've got student bodies that are younger, more vibrant and more in touch with reality um, and who people really are than, you know, say, I don't know, wherever Ron DeSantis lives. I don't know. (laughs) I don't know where he lives either because it's not on this planet. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, wherever he does live, I wish he'd go back to it and just stay there and not talk to anybody anymore with his crazy ideas. In my opinion, he is, I don't want to turn this into a political thing and people will hate me, but I don't care. He's more dangerous than Donald Trump in some ways just because he's actually pretty smart and he is... Just, I don't know, he's just got like a bee in his bonnet about some stuff that I don't understand. Yeah. Doesn't seem pretty relevant to making life better for people. But I also want to say quickly about these guys. They're the real deal. You know, they've appeared in Forbes, Yahoo Finance, NBC's The Squawk Box, News with Shepard Smith, ABC News, Rachel Ray Show, which I would have liked to see that. Good Morning America. So they're kind of celebrities and they are going to, you know, they're they're out there trying to make a difference. So were you, how did you guys get started in this? Were you in financial services or what's your background that one day you just said, okay, we're going to become the debt-free guys. And I mean, I love some of the stuff on your website. I love what you have. You know, we totally get that you want to be fabulous, but at the same time, struggle with paying bills. Don't understand how everyone else can afford Sunday fun day. Well, you have to say next time, ladies, feel pressure to like, <laughs> to be, I like this one, to be like Mitch and Cam when you really feel like Johnny and Moira, <laughs> which I <laughs> often do, <laughs> and dream of retiring poolside in Palm Springs, which Frequently, I say to my husband, I really want to buy a second house in Palm Springs because we spend a lot of time there. So I totally understand everything that you were saying. I was like, I love these guys and I don't know where they came from, but can you tell us where you came from? (laughs) Crawled out from a rock. No. Uh, make a long story short, about a year and a half after David and I got together, uh, we f- had a confession moment where we realized that we had $51,000 in credit card debt between the two of us. Um, the irony was, though, at the time, we had a tenure in financial service, combined tenure of 15 years. So yes, we, right. here we were helping other people with their money, uh, helping them save for retirement, analyze their stocks, make better investment decisions, all that. Um, but we were horrible with ourselves. Fast forward a couple right. of years later, when I was a compliance manager for a financial services firm, and I was reviewing brokers before they came, we onboarded them into our firm. And you would be surprised, well, maybe you won't be surprised, but your audience might be surprised to know the percentage of financial advisors who have delinquencies, bankruptcies, low credit scores, you know. So it's, it's, it wasn't just us, so that was heartening. Um, but that was sort of when we were like, well, how do we have all this theoretical knowledge, but we're not actually implementing right. in our own life? Like, what are we doing wrong here? And that was uh, when we sort of hit our rock bottom and we decided to come up with a strategy to pay off our debt. And about we the strategy uh, was to pay off the debt within three years. We paid it off in about two and a half years, but toward the end of wrapping that up, we thought, well, here we have like both this personal and professional experience with money. Uh, maybe there's a way that we can use it to help other people. And so we thought we would write a book. Um, and in the in the process of pitching the book, we realized that we didn't have a platform. And that's kind of how we started the, the blog. And then eventually we started the podcast. And then we eventually published the book. Right. Because debt is insidious. And it's something that, you know, everybody is plagued with. I know for myself, I had some very dark years after my divorce. It took many years to get litigated. I had children in college. Um, my ex-husband did not honor the decree, so then he stopped paying the, the alimony part of it. And then we had to go through another court case. So then I had a couple of years where I just moved back here from London. I hadn't gotten a job yet, and I was trying to get my kids acclimated. And I was funding that Delta with credit card debt. And then I found myself with like $100,000 worth of credit card debt after four years of, you know, trying to pay legal bills. So I was trying to use my money for that. And then I had these kids and and then I got my job at Morgan Stanley and, you know, became a wealth manager. And, and I'm doing, I started all this at 53, right? So I'm 64 now. So it's taken me a while to get there, but I have had to really do some soul searching. But I mean, when the debt was the worst, I and I was going through the divorce, I was literally getting up every night at three o'clock in the morning. For four years, I just never slept. And it affected my health. 
It affected my blood pressure. I was, you know, just generating tons of cortisol. I'm going to blame it on that. <laughs> Getting fatter by the minute. Um, just because I was so stressed out all the time. Drank a ton of Jameson. It was just not a good look for me. So when I was able to get my my job in order and start back into it, I really was committed to paying this down. And I think what you're doing is really important because I equate being financially organized and okay, you can use your credit cards and pay them off. And sometimes we do have to use them and let them, you know, be carried for a bit. But being debt-free will extend your life, in my opinion. It will reduce the stress and, the, and all the other stuff that goes with it. So you had, now, are you guys still in financial services or are you just uh, now uh, doing your platform? After we had that conversation about getting out of debt and why we were in debt, we'd started to talk about what we wanted our lives to look like. What was our, we didn't like the direction our lives were headed. Granted, we were having a lot of fun, but it was kind of that temporary fun, you know, dropping $100 a person on brunch or yeah. taking a trip for the weekend to Miami, all that kind of stuff. But it wasn't, it wasn't lasting, right? It took us a little while, but we realized what we really wanted our lives to look like. And John and I were very much in love. And we said, why do we leave for work every morning at six o'clock and come home at six o'clock? make dinner, watch TV for two hours, go to sleep and do this. I mean, literally we're giving away our lives to someone else's dream. And, you know, that's become the cliche. And a lot of people talk about that today, but we, we decided to do something about it. So our, our primary goal was that we eventually wanted to be able to work for ourselves and not have to work for anyone else so we could spend more time together. Now we spend 24 hours a day together, and sometimes <laughs> Never been we happier. ask ourselves whether it has to no. <laughs> You might appreciate this. We had like all of our licenses, our 24, 66, 7, 9, 8, 9, all that stuff. It was gut wrenching when those finally expired. Like, like they, yeah. they expired two years. All I think, that after. work. Yeah. And yeah. I'm like, oh my gosh, do we really want to let these go? Should we just go back to work for a couple more months and try to retain them for two more years? And we're like, no, we got to burn those boats. How hard was it for you to pivot? I mean, what were the. What was going through your analysis? How did you prepare for it? Did you save money to be able to do it so you could have a period of time? What did that financially look like for you? I know emotionally, as much as you, you know, sometimes you want to walk away from it all, it's pretty scary. So tell us a little bit about your process, because I think a lot of people in the audience are always interested about pivoting mm -hmm. and changing their lives because we're all searching for that thing, you know, and and work can be very soul destroying. Yeah, 100%. Um, so this is John again. So we had paid off our debt and we had saved up enough uh, three to six months worth of emergency savings. I think we had three months at that time. I'm not entirely sure. Um, but we were getting ready to publish the book. We were kind of dabbling in doing our own business. We hadn't actually ever talked about seriously about quitting. But uh, my last year at a financial services firm, all of a sudden I got a boss and it was just a very acrimonious relationship. It was very um, antagonistic. And I started to uh, become very depressed. I would sleep all weekend long. I would hate work. Mm -hmm. You know, it's just a very miserable situation. And David and I were walking one day uh, for lunch and he looked at me and goes, we have our emergency savings. We don't have any debt. We own our own home. Like we don't have, we have a dream. We don't want to put up with this. If you, you don't have to put up with this if you don't want to, if you want to quit, you can do that. So we went home that weekend and kind of just assessed all of our numbers to make sure we were making a somewhat smart decision. And the numbers made sense. And there's no reason for me to put up with it anymore. So I went into my, my boss the, that next Monday and I said, I'm giving you my two weeks notice. And that was the most liberating experience I've ever had. And then a week and a half or so later, we had a whole an all call with our entire department. And uh, my boss's boss asked uh, what my plan was after I left uh, my, my firm. And I think they thought that I was going to say, I'm going to go to this other company or do this other job. Right. And I had nothing lined up at that point. And I just said, I don't really know what I'm going to do for a while. I'm just going to take some time off. And I thought that was like the most, like the, the best F you to somebody. Like I didn't, I don't need yeah, to put yeah. up with your garbage <laughs> and that's why I'm leaving. And I'm not going to, I don't have to rush and go work at McDonald's or Starbucks or go to another firm. I can, I can leave and, and take several months off. And that's what I ended up doing. Um, and that gave us the opportunity for me to lay the groundwork to start our business. Um, we were mostly blogging at that point, working on trying to get the book published. And I did that for several months. I don't remember exactly how long, but we started to use more of our money than we wanted to. And so I actually went back to uh, work for another firm for a couple of years as a, uh, to help us build the, the, the business. And then uh, I quit again uh, two years later. And then David quit about a year after me. Two years later. 
two years later. But you were doing check-ins all the time. Like, where are we with our money? Where are we towards getting to this goal of, you know, really being totally independent of all of this structured kind of work environment? But you were doing it in a logical, it wasn't like you just threw, you know, one day you walked in and said, I quit and I'm not going to, you know, worry about how I'm going to accomplish this. So I think that's something everyone needs to take away from this. They were very logical and quantitative about it, right? Yeah. My father would argue we weren't logical. though. <laughs> he didn't like any of the numbers. He wanted me to stay. Right. I, I, I will yeah, say. Yeah, well, you know, parents. One, one of the important things is that John and I, once we paid our debt off, we didn't do what a lot of folks do, and that is go back to their old lifestyle. I'll, I'll, right. I'll take a step back. We actually did for a short time period, and within a year, we had $6,000 of credit card debt again, and we said, what the heck are we doing? We just went through this. Let's stop this. So what got us there is what was going to get us to where we wanted to really be. So instead of inflating our lifestyle, we kind of went back to the lifestyle that we had when we were paying our debt off because we figured out how to do it in an enjoyable way. We started funneling a lot of our money into our 401ks. And so mm -hmm. when it when we got to that point where we were talking about quitting and starting our own business, there were certain check boxes that we could say, we don't need to do this. We don't have to have money for this. We don't have to have money for this. And one of those was we actually got to the point where we didn't need to save any more money for retirement because we were on a trajectory to have as much as we wanted to and possibly even more. And so the maintaining the lifestyle that we had, not inflating our lifestyle and going back to the way that we had been living was probably the key piece that allowed us to eventually get to that point of saying, okay, we can quit. Because we, when we quit, we had near seven figures in our retirement accounts. And that right. just made us feel so much better about, okay, we don't have to save any money, any money for retirement. We can focus on how do we generate enough money to live off of on a daily, daily basis. And you guys are, if you don't mind me asking, because I know that you're way younger than I am, what's uh, the age range? <laughs> Is that private information? You don't have to answer that if you don't want. But are you like in your 40s, 30s? I'm oh, in my 40s. That, if you if you think I, I look like I'm in my 30s, then um, <laughs> this filter is really good. You need glasses. <laughs> I thought you were probably in your late 30s. That's where I was thinking you were. No, so. I'm 49. I turned 50 in September, David. Oh, I dude, you look amazing. Mark. We have a very rigorous skincare routine. We do. I, was just, I don't know what your skincare <laughs> regime is, but we can talk about that later because we might want to share that. Um, but I will say this, that's very impressive. And I just actually did, it hasn't aired yet, but I did a podcast on the topic of fire and if it's still kind of uh, doable and viable in this day and age uh, with recession and inflation, and all that stuff. And I think it's really should be financial independence, more options, not financial independence, retire early. But one thing I wanted to ask you about, and I do talk about this, is that so you got the 401k covered and you feel confident. And I think given what you just said, you should you should feel pretty good about that. So if you were to continue to work, you know, you can't really, you don't really want to take anything out until you're 59 and a half because you got that penalty of 10%. But if you wanted to, like I have people that say I want to retire at 50 and I'm like, okay, well, that's good, but you really don't want to use your retirement money in your qualified accounts because you're going to get a penalty and you get taxed at ordinary income rates on those distributions. So you should also have a taxable account that can create yield for you, which will give you an income flow to live off of until you tap into that retirement money. That will be taxed at the lower rate between 15 and 20% if it's mainly dividend income, assuming you don't have tons of ordinary income and interest although that might be changing with interest rates at, at the moment, but they'll probably go back down a little bit again. But anyway, my point being is, do you uh, talk to people about giving them guidance on, well, first of all, you have to be debt-free. So I'm assuming that you're giving them the tools for that. And then do you also kind of guide them towards this like long-term planning of really how to get to the end game and live a retirement that is in dignity, but also enjoying their lives? And being able to deal with increased medical costs and possible the need for long-term care. You know, these are all things that all of us have to deal with. So how does that fit into the the message? Because I have a feeling you guys talk a, a lot about reducing debt, but also about a lot of other things that 
not having debt and credit card debt and having a budget helps you build and building net worth. Right. So we do, um, we have for quite a while, while focused on the foundational piece. And that foundational piece is getting your financial life under control. And to be honest, right now, we are working on several tools that we call the Wealth Builders Pyramid. And okay. really the idea here is is to do exactly what you you said, is to put yourself in that position where what you have created will take care of you for the rest of your life. And so much focus has been put on putting money into the market, putting money into the market, putting money into the market. Put it, and then we are right now seeing folks who are worried about because of the market pullback, how do I deal with the fact that I can't withdraw 4% now because that doesn't cover enough. Yeah. Now I've got to drive withdraw 5.5%, 6%. So the foundational piece of the Wealth Builders Pyramid, is, of course, is getting your financial life in order. But after that, it's a three-part piece, three pieces to it. One is that portfolio of stocks or assets that are going to be uh, basically paper assets that allow you to fund yourself. Another piece is a real estate portfolio that is giving yes. you cash flow. And when I say a real estate portfolio, a lot of people think, okay, well, that's my home. And that's not yeah. it. Your home is never your, the, your, you cannot use your home as your, the way to fund your retirement unless you want to sell your home. Okay. And I want you to else. repeat that because I say <laughs> this to my clients all the time. You guys live in your home. You love your home. Right. You're not going to want to move from your home when you're in retirement, when you just want to chill in your home. Right. Yeah. So take that. I mean, it is part of your net worth, but don't rely on that because do you really want to sell your home in Maybe you want to downsize, but I know I don't. Yeah. You know, do you really want to sell your home? So I think you're making a very good point here. And I would like you to say that again. Your yeah. home is not part of it. Yeah, your, your, your home is not a retirement plan. It is not. Un unless, like you said, you plan to... To sell your million dollar home and move to Toledo, Ohio, <laughs> right? Well, you never know. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, and then the third piece is having some sort of small business. And the idea there is you've created something that is generating some sort of income for you. For some people, that will be, it could be as simple as selling digital products. For other people, mm -hmm. it might be that you have a, you, you actually do have a small business that you run, whether it's a store on Etsy or uh, you, you have some sort of, of, of business. And the whole idea is that those three pieces, those should cover 100 to 150 percent of your expenses. Our ultimate goal is 50 percent of your cash flow comes from your portfolio, 50 percent of comes from your real estate, and 50 percent comes from your small business. So right. at any moment, whether your business is down a little bit, or the portfolio is down a little bit, or the real estate, you're, you have a unit that's not being rented, you're always covering about 100% of your your day-to-day -day needs. And if done properly, all of those things should appreciate with the cost in, in, of inflation. They should go up in value. Right. So you're going to keep pace with inflation because if you have a rental property, you're going to be able to increase the rent because things are more expensive. And we see rental property rents have gone up. And if you are doing a job, maybe you'll, you know, you, you will pass along whatever your costs are and higher prices or something in that nature. I think what you just set forth there is, is really, really good. It's very solid planning. And it's, you know, I like the idea of the 150%. In uh, one of the things I will say, like in our portfolio construction, we use dividend growth investing as our cornerstone so that that yield doesn't, you can still take money out of your portfolio through income. Mm -hmm. And we use a lot of alternatives now that are generating like five, six, seven percent yeah. yield, so that you're not having to take a pay cut, you know, when prices are going down. Yeah. But that can't be it. You need to have a diversified situation. Let me ask you a question. It's kind of a segue, but I think it also is very relevant to the long term planning for people. So what are some of the biggest financial challenges that the LGBTQ plus community has faced? And is facing because, you know, when you co-mingle your assets and you're married, all of that 
is following you through your life, through your retirement. Let's talk a little bit about that because I know I don't really, you know, I just don't know how how secure do you feel and all the legal situation in this country and then how that all affects this. It's a great and it's a timely question. If you would have asked this question two years ago, we would have said, you know, everything seems great and comfortable and we're, we're we, everything is just, you know, we're just like everybody else, uh, uh, just like straight couples. But with the now 430-some plus anti-LGBTQ plus bills on the floors of state legislatures across the country, according to ACLU, and Supreme Court justices saying that they specifically want to target uh, marriage equality, a lot of same-sex couples specifically in the community are, are kind of feeling like we're going back to uh, 2014 and even earlier again, where we had to sort of do this patchwork of legal maneuvering to protect our assets and protect the person that we live with and love. Um, I, we know that a lot of LGBTQ plus or same-sex couples are kind of going back to their attorney and, and trying to rebuild uh, that sort, those sort of protections in case, for whatever reason and whatever maneuvering that they do, that our marriages are dissolved. Uh, David and I just had a meeting with our attorney today to do that very same thing. It might be a little bit conservative on our part to do that. So what could you do? What advice are you getting? Because I'm very curious about that. Because I'm thinking, how in God's name can you plan for your retirement where you, you know, you're married, you guys are married, you commingled some of your assets, maybe, you know, you still have separate assets, hopefully, and you commingled intentionally. But, you know, you're going to be dealing with each other's care, medical directives, long-term care. If you need to get, you know, you're going to want to buy maybe a long-term care insurance policy together. How is this affected legally if if they came in and said, in Ohio, your marriage isn't valid anymore? I mean, how can people live like that? What can you do to protect yourself? Yeah, so with marriage, uh, with marriage there are about th- a thousand protections and benefits that come with that privilege of being able to get married. For the same-sex couples, a lot of those privileges would be dissolved. So we have to patchwork that with wills and trusts uh, and, and, build, and solidifying our estate, making sure that our homes are within in a joint tenants with rights of survivorship, yeah, uh-huh. uh, making sure that all of our beneficiaries and all of our accounts are exactly who they're supposed to be, um, and making it right. crystal clear in our will who gets our assets should one of us, well, one of us is going to die sooner than the other, who, who gets all those assets when one of us dies? And who gets them after both of us dies? Yeah. And I mean, really, estate planning, I know people don't like to think about it or they don't think they need it if they don't have a lot of money. That's not true. OK, you need to have a trust so that especially in a situation where your your rights can be altered by some third party entity that isn't you, um, that specifies who your beneficiaries are, who's going to be your medical directive, who's going to decide all those things that you want them to decide. Also, your comment about owning things in joint tenancy, that way, upon the death of the first person, it will pass on to the other person without probate. And then it's a seamless thing. But you need to, I would say, be very, very careful right now, because honestly, I mean, I have several clients that are uh, married and two of my best, very dear friends that I met when I was 17 are my clients and they... Adrian and Chris, they got married and live in, they moved to London because they were just like, she happened, Adriana happened to get, you know, transferred through her job, but they never came back because they don't trust the laws here to protect them as gay women who are married and they have a son. And so they're just like, we're just not ever going to come back because it's too volatile. Mm-hmm. It's, it's not consistent. There's no Makes consistency sense. to this. And so what can we do to, besides that, I guess the only other thing you can do is vote, right? You can vote oh, and get more involved in your local politics. That's where a lot of the changes uh, uh, is happening most aggressively is the state and local level. So uh, a lot of us su- seem to only be focused on the national level and who's in, who's in office right. at the, in the White House. And unfortunately, I, you know, Dave and I will, 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 will acknowledge that many in our community are saying, great, we, got, we have a Democrat in office. We're good for the next four years. Um, many of us aren't paying attention to what's happening um, behind at the state level. I'll argue that since uh, Roe v. Wade passed, the far right has become very organized in how they were going to try to overturn Roe v. Wade. And now that they've done that, they are doing what they can to sort of Christian nationalize. They're going to move on to other issues. Right. They're very organized. And even if they're the minority, they're very vocal. And also, we do have a Supreme Court that does not lean you know, in a very uh, open and accepting way. And those guys are going to be, and gals, they're going to be on the court for a long time unless 
you know, on something happens to them. So it is a very tricky environment. So part of being financially organized, especially if you are in the LGBTQ plus community, is understanding that you need to get very focused on your estate planning. Mm-hmm. And then I want to also talk to you about something I talk a lot about. I believe when you get married, everybody should have a prenup. I think we all come into the, it does, it's not like the old days where everyone's like, oh, you have to be rich to have a prenup. No, that's wrong. 30% of millennials do have prenups, and a lot of it is because of student debt, right? So we are carrying debt into our marriages. And also, if people have children, one person may decide to, to step away from their career. I believe they should be compensated for that through a formula that I have talked about a lot that should be put in the prenup. But do you talk about this in your writings? Do you encourage people in the community to have prenups? I think it's it, it doesn't matter who your partner is. I think you should have a prenup just to keep clear what they own before they come in, how you're going to resolve debt that might be out there that one person might have more than the other, and then what's going to happen. And it also opens up the conversation about money, right? Because mm-hmm. we all have different money languages. We all have different money personalities. And if those two things don't jive in a, in a relationship, it will make the relationship go away. So how are you approaching that? Are you talking about it? What do you think about it? We did do an episode on the Queer Money podcast a while back. Actually, we, this may be something we should revisit, but we did do an episode on pre and post nups uh, and right. the importance and the value of those. It's not uncommon in the LGBT community for people to get into relationships and have gotten into that relationship maybe a little bit older in their lives. There's not mm-hmm. a lot of sweet 16 stories in the LGBT community of kids who meet in high school going on to get married and be together for, for decades. So a lot of us are getting married when, when we're entering into these kind of relationships, when we are a little bit older, we're in our thirties, forties, sometimes even, even after that. So we have very well established lives. And when I say well-established, I'm not talking about the amount of money you have, because there are some people who are very well-established, but they're well-established in their habit of spending more money than they make every single month, right? And so you do bring up a very interesting and very important point is that just by talking about having a prenup, it does basically pull the covers back on your the financial situation of the person you're going into this partnership with. And that's what the way that we we talk about a marriage is it is a partnership, right? And so you have to be on the same team together. You don't have to be exactly the same. You like you've mentioned, we all have our own languages of of and our own backstories, our money stories as to why or how we have um, interact with money, but it does give you the opportunity to to have that conversation. Hopefully, we would encourage you to be having that kind of money conversation as soon as you've made this kind of person you're going steady yes. with. Even you if you're going to like if you're going to live with somebody, yes. I say even then you should if you have assets or even if you don't, I think you should have a cohabitation agreement only because you can say, okay, you know, this is how we're going to divide stuff up, especially since you're not married, then you don't have the protection of mm-hmm. the marital, you know, laws. So, I think when you're commingling assets, you need to be very intentional about commingling. And when you're commingling credit, yes. because your credit could affect my credit. And if I don't know what you're do- up to, then it could be really bad news for me. So we should each have our own credit cards and then maybe have a joint one. But I do think everybody needs to talk about this, because if you can't be transparent about where you're at with your finances, with your partner, then it's going to be a really long relationship. And we need to get all of our skeletons out there at the beginning. Like, maybe I have a lot of debt. Maybe I have to take care of my parents. Maybe I have, you know, some other obligations that you didn't know about that's going to take money out of my pocket that you haven't thought about. And then also, if we were to part, you know, how are we going to co-mingle the money that we do co-mingle? And I really encourage everyone to have that conversation because it doesn't mean you don't love each other. It means that you really trust each other enough to talk about it. And it it isn't not romantic. I think when you feel good about your finances, then you can go on those vacations. Mm -hmm. Then you can do all those things that will inculcate feelings of love and not like, oh, God, I'm so stressed out about our money because you did this and we never talked about it. (laughs) Right, right. But I wanted to delve into, I like this idea about creating and managing a budget with a partner because obviously 
when we're building our net worth in a partnership, whether because we live with somebody for a long time or we're marrying them, it's like a little business, right? Money infiltrates every aspect of our lives. It is just inextricably linked with life unless you, you know, have $300 million and you don't have to worry about it. So what tips do you give people about establishing a budget with their partner? And then I want to go on to, because I want to learn this too, the tips that you have about getting out of debt without missing the fun. Of course. Yeah, this is a great question. So one of the things we'd like to tell, especially younger couples, couples just starting out um, who want, want to have the budget conversation is first focus on the fun first. What is it that you... What are the goals you guys want to achieve? Where do you want to travel to? Do you want to have children? Like, what is what is, what is the happiest life for you look like? Because then, once you figure out what your mutual goals are, what your individual goals are, then you can start to itemize what all that is going to cost, and you can sort of drill down over the time in the discussion to say, okay, well, what do we have to do to get to reach these goals? How do we have to how do we have to make a budget to reach the, those goals? And then eventually, the question comes up: Are there any hurdles that are preventing us from? from reaching those goals. And that's when the debt conversation can come up, the student loan conversation. Um, and so focusing on goals first makes the conversation fun. Yeah. It starts it at it's a, a very, good way to uh, start, I think. Amicable yeah. level for everybody. And then eventually you just kind of reverse engineer it and say, okay, how do we actually get to this particular point in time? And I think that's a good idea because there are things that if you share things that you enjoy together, then you're starting that conversation off with that yeah. and that's a fun thing right because when you talk about a budget everyone's like uh, eyes glaze over it's and, like a diet. you know i'm always like <laughs> eeks i don't you know even though i write about it and tell everyone you gotta have a budget and i do it and like now i actually look at it as um because it's increased my self-esteem by knowing knowledge is power right so as long as both people in the partnership are aware of what's going on i have clients that come in and you know some of the wives have no idea what their husbands make like no clue. Oh, they don't geez. know what their assets are. They don't know what accounts they have. And if that person were to like, you know, drop dead today, and this has happened, a lot of these women are just like, I have no idea what I own. Right. And then in a divorce situation, they're even further behind the eight ball because if you don't know, you can't subpoena documents and discovery. And usually in a divorce, when people already are kind of not too happy with each other, once the divorce process starts, they don't really want to produce documents. Right. And so there's that big fight. And then you don't want to really hire a forensic accountant because they're super expensive. But if you have to, you have to. So, And that's the thing is like a lot of these issues are applicable to everybody, right? It's just if you're in a relationship, these things are applicable. But I do want to say what is more relevant to the LGBTQ community is that they really do. And I want to keep hammering away on this. Just make sure you have all your legal documentation in order because mm -hmm. you do not want the whole house of cards falling down because of some thing that we can't anticipate. And that, I think, is, is, is an absolute tragedy on so many levels. But anyway, I would like to ask you a, a, another question because I do think it's an interesting question, which is money and self-esteem and money and who we are are all very much tied up sometimes. Some people are cool and they, they just don't give a hoot about money. And that money personality is called the indifferent. <laughs> and those are people that usually have inherited money, but <laughs> um, because they have a lot of money and they don't have to worry about it. But what guidance would you give people about how money fits into their self-worth, their self-esteem, you know, how they feel confidence in themselves? I think one of the important things to remember is that money is not a ruler. It's, it's a tool and it's not a ruler to be used to judge yourself against anyone else, right? There are amazing, beautiful, wonderful people in this world who make forty or $50,000 a year. That doesn't mean that they're any less of a person than somebody who's making four, five, six hundred thousand dollars $600,000 a year. Does the outward appearance of their life look different? Absolutely. But there are plenty of ways to enjoy and have a, 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 an abundant and happy life on a lower amount of money. John and I make less money today than we did when we were working together in financial services, but our lives are full of so much more joy and happiness. And the uh, amount of time we get to spend together, the fact that we get to take our dogs on walks whenever we want to, yeah. we can travel the world and go wherever it is that we choose to. Yes, we're working on oftentimes when we travel because that's the way we've designed our lives. But money is a tool to 
build the life and the lifestyle that you want. If your goal is to acquire things, then you're going to have to have more money, right? If you really want to have certain things in life and those are important to you, and to some people, some of those things are important, right? Some people want to have a 5,000 square foot house because family is important to them and they want to have right. four or five kids. Well, then they need to be making sure that their lifestyle is and their income is built around how do we build that 5,000 square foot house with six bedrooms, right? They have to have that kind of, that, but that's what's important to them. If you're a person where outdoor and being in nature and those kinds of things are important to you, you don't have to pay for any of that or very little for the, uh, for that. You don't have to have that higher amount of income, right? So design your life the way you want it. Figure out what kind of life you want and then put the money equation on top of that. It is not a judgment as to who you are, as to how much money you have. It just means your tools are used differently when you're yeah. creating your life. And I think that ties in really well with your goals based, like goals first. So that's a good conversation to have with your partner. If you don't have the same goals, then you might want to consider not being together because honestly, you know, you're not going to want to spend your money on the same thing. I'm really impressed with this. I like the way that you've articulated it. I think I like this concept of goals first. I think when we talk about budgeting, we often just talk about, okay, fixed cost, discretionary cost, you know, the 50, uh, 30, 20 rule. Yeah. But I do think what you guys are saying about goals being first, I really love that idea. That's something I haven't really thought about before, and I'm going to steal it and talk about it. <laughs> and I'm going to credit you guys for it. <laughs> there's, there's actually a budgeting style for those kinds of conversations or for those kinds of people. It's a yes budget. And really what a yes budget is, is I need to take care of my expenses, right? I need to pay my bills and I need to cover my necessities. My necessities are what is it that I, how, how am I going to feed myself? How am I going to clothe myself, get myself to work? Those kinds of things, right? right? And then the next step is what are our future goals? What are we putting money towards? And then after that, it's yes to anything that I want to spend my money on, right? Oh my God, I love this. So you're, you know, a lot of times people say, I hate budgeting because it tells me I can't do this and I can't do that. Well, if you know exactly what it is you want, then all you say is yes to spending money on those things. And a budget is an enabler to get you to the yes, you know, the big yes. Yeah, and exactly. I just, I love the way you guys frame it. And I know that you have a book that you can download from your website too, right? About eradicating debt, how to get rid of debt. Oh, um, no, you can't download it, but you can buy it. <laughs> oh, you can buy it. Okay. Yeah, it's but there was like a free worksheet or something. Oh, yeah. Right? We have the, the seven-step credit card. No, wait, show the book again. Tell so, us the name of the book again and tell us about the website. Sure. So this this uh, our book is called For the Four Principles of a Debt-Free Life, which is right? the first book that we wrote. And it is very kind of autobiographical about our story and us paying our debt off and the, the tools and principles that we used. And all this is going to be in the show notes. So. And we kind of, there are really basically four principles there, and that's be money conscious, cash is king, have a plan, and now I'm forgetting the I know, you, one. You probably <laughs> on the spot. It's been I, a couple of years since I read my own book. I love cash is king, though. I mean, honestly, I have found for myself that the best way for me not to use my credit cards is, so I used to always make fun out of my dad. God bless him. He's 93. He lives in Pittsburgh. That's why I go back there all the time. And he always used to like walk around with a bunch of C notes, right? He looked like a gangster <laughs> and he just hated credit cards. He's just like, I'm paying cash for everything. So he'd just walk around and be like, daddy, like, don't bring out that thing. You know, you're going to get mugged. <laughs> but now I'm kind of like him. It's like, I'd rather just go out to dinner old school and pay cash. That way it's not on my credit cards. I know I'm not going to like get points or whatever. I don't care about the points. I just don't want to think about it after I'm, I, I get up. I don't want to be looking at you know the bill, even if I pay off the thing every month in full. I just, I don't know. Maybe I, as I get older, I, I love this idea of budgeting with um, envelopes. I know that sounds so corny, but I do think it's effective because we forget when we literally never bring out 
anything tangible to pay now, Mm -hmm. we can pay on our phones. We can pay while we're like watching TV. We can go buy Jimmy Choo shoes while we're watching TV and have PayPal do it. And then we totally forget. And the Jimmy Choo shoes appear at my doorstep. And I'm like, oh my God, I just bought like really expensive Jimmy Choo shoes. And they even hurt my feet. And I didn't even (laughs) think about it. Uh, And, you know, like we just spend money because it's so easy. And I do think that, um, it is so important. That's where we get. That's where the thread gets lost, and then we get debt, and then all of a sudden we're just like, "Oh my God, what's happened to me?" So you guys have so many great tips for everybody. Before I ask you where everyone can find you, I want you to just tell me. It's a very open-ended question, but out of all the things that you're concerned about right now in the world, what's on your mind? Uh, Christian nationalists. I would agree with that. It, it, this is kind of tying into what John just said, but John and I did a very deep dive into how financial services and um, certain people in the thin influencer community are funding all of that. Um, people that we all know and how their podcast and their connection to churches is directly funding the donor advised funds that puts money into the hands of the lawyers, the politicians, the school board members that Obvious. are removing women's rights. They are, yeah. uh, they are rolling back a racial inequality in this country to the 60s, and they are taking away rights of LGBT people all across this country. That's a very good point. I didn't really think about that, but that's true. All these people are putting money into donor advised funds or some sort of charitable 503, you know, 501c3. Billions can, of dollars a year. And yeah. the LGBT community is not doing anything close to that. And I would argue maybe women in general and black and brown people aren't at nearly as organized as the Christian right is. No, and I think we are going backwards. I mean, women have lost so many rights. I mean, with respect to their reproductive rights, with respect, while they're never going to have gender parity with, um, it's going to take us 135 years, I think I read, to get to gender uh, parity on pay. But, you know, the reproductive thing is a big deal, right? Because it, it can affect a woman's life forever economically, especially if they can't afford it. And then all of a sudden, like we're becoming smaller, I think, you know, we don't want people to just love whoever the heck they love. I mean, look, it's hard enough to be happy in this world, right? Without trying to pigeonhole everyone into this kind of Phil Schlafly, this is the way the world should be, you know, uh, everybody should be married to someone of the opposite sex and have 3.5 children or whatever that thing is. And I have some friends who are in the Christian community, they're gay men, and they feel accepted in some ways by their community. But I, I don't know, I don't, I mean, I'm trying to reconcile all that, because I do think there's a lot of judgment out there. And I'm very, very afraid by what Ron DeSantis is doing in Florida. And I know some people won't agree with me, but I don't understand, like, how that can be legislated that you can't say certain words. I mean, this is positively frightening to me. There is a difference between being a Christian and following the principles of Jesus Christ and being a theocratic country. Just look at some of the people that Jesus spent his time with in the Bible. When you read the Bible and the people that Jesus spent his time with, and the individuals that he threw out of the temple were the people who were making a profit off of controlling other people with God's word. How dissimilar is that to what we're seeing happening in our country today? The word of God is being used as a yeah. tool to empower politicians and make them money and keep other people small. And that's why, that's, that, I think that's one of the scariest things that, that we're ha- that's happening right now. There are good Christians out there. There are good people who truly love their neighbor and they understand that, that everyone sins and falls short of the glory of God, right? right? But there's also others who decide that it's their ability to judge other people with that word that is breaking away from what true Christianity is. I would I would agree. And I, I also say one thing I am, and then we'll wrap up, um, is that I'm always mystified when people are getting interviewed and they say, what's the most important thing, you know, in the elections and what you're thinking about? And people will say, oh, you know, inflation. And I want to say, 
wait a minute, inflation comes and goes, okay? And, and, and this inflation is, there was COVID, there was a supply chain problem. I think inflation is mainly for because of supply chain problems, not because of the fact that people got a bunch of money. That didn't help, but the supply chain was really the problem. But that's a different podcast. But I want to say, wait, you're going to vote strictly on inflation when LGBTQ people are being told they might not be able to be married anymore after they got married? Women can't have any rights about their reproduction. Um, I don't even want to, you know, get into the whole thing with these people in the transgender community who have a lot on their plate to deal with right now. But this is what we're worried about. Like, this is the only thing you're thinking about when you're choosing your leaders is inflation. I personally find that kind of mystifying, but... Well, I think it's it's an, e- it's an easy target for the Republican Party party if we were we should be talking about the economy that should be the thing yeah, that we have to focus on but they can't necessarily win on that so they've got to manufacture a culture war um, because they can very often garner votes that way but i think they might have overstepped the line with the dobbs decision and um, yeah. because women seem to even in the red states seem to be um standing up and saying hey you, you took it too far so hopefully that continues i mean come on whether they like it or not and what i guess my thing is and i get on my uh, soapbox about is is it you can't tell people they have to have a baby and then not give a child care tax credit, not give them ways to raise this child and give them assistance. So you want them to have a baby. You don't want to give them any assistance. And then all those poor kids might end up in poverty, might end up in social services. And when 18-year-old kids leave social services, and this is a fact, 50% of them end up homeless. So is this really what we want? But we need to be more inclusive. I mean, I really love your message. I think you know, all of your fundamental uh, principles about budgeting, about retirement. I'm definitely going with the yes budget and the goals first budget. I'm going to credit you guys every single time, but honestly, brilliant, brilliant approach. And I think that is what we need to, when we're trying to eradicate debt and we're trying to get our financial house in order for the long term, that long, beautiful life that you want to have, you got to follow these guys. So where can they find you? What do they need to buy so they can learn? How? Where are they listening? Tell us all. Sure. Well, we're uh, debtfreeguys.com and queermoneypodcast.com. And on social media, we're either Debt Free Guys or Queer Money Pod or Podcast. We have uh, pr- different products and services and tools, a lot of which are free on both of our websites. So uh, feel free to take advantage of any of that. Yeah. Check these guys out. They're going to teach you how to say yes. And I like that positive spin. Well, David and John, thank you so much for joining me today. This has been awesome. I think we could do a whole other podcast on so many other things. And I will say to everybody out there, your vote, your voice, get involved, spread the word. Let's not be apathetic. If we want things to change, we have to make them change. So it's not going to happen overnight and it's not going to happen by us not doing anything. So Thank you for joining us today. I hope you enjoyed this podcast. I think it's a very meaningful podcast and I hope that you guys return to listen to my next one. Thank you very much. Thank you for listening today to the Fiscal Feminist Podcast. Please take a minute to subscribe to the podcast on your preferred podcast platform. And I would really appreciate if you could also rate and review it. You can also find me on Instagram and TikTok at the Fiscal Feminist or check out the website, fiscalfeminist.com.